Uh, good afternoon, everybody. <clears throat> uh, very happy to host this session. It's been power pack session in these two days where uh, people share their lovely experiences. And <clears throat> we have gone through, and they, they, they told their experience what they have gone through these past two years. And it taught us the, this two years taught them uh, great experiences and unfold their opp new opportunities also. Uh, first of all, uh, I would like to share some numbers where we are living in India. So there are the 800 million internet users, 500 million internet users on the smartphone, a 50% uh, Indian population is below 25 years of age, a 65% a population of India is below 35 years of age, and 97% of Indian PIN codes are served by the e-commerce industry. 100 million shipments are done by the e-commerce company each month, every month. A 55 to 60% orders are coming from tier two, tier three, tier four cities. This is, <clears throat> this is the India, this is a, and let's accept without online, a future growth will be bleak for any organization. They can't grow as the numbers that are like the people who are into the online as well as the offline. I would like to talk about creating a profitable online and offline through the store based, but before that, I would like to take a couple of minutes from each of you. I would like to know about your personal brand story and your experience of these two years of, I think, I should say it's a painful two years which we have gone through. So, Quinny, I would like to start from you. Tell us, tell us about your story, your experiences of these two years. Can, can I be heard? Yeah. Well, I uh, actually, what happened with jewelry, it had a bit of a standstill during COVID. We, uh, we've been predominantly an offline brand because our jewelry is statement pieces and consumers like to see it on them and touch and feel is a very important aspect. But during COVID, during the pandemic, we definitely upped our website and found that people were looking at uh, the website and uh, knowing what we have and then getting back to us. And what we were able to do is, of course, everything was shut. But what we were able to do very soon after the pandemic was to send the pieces to the people uh, one of our main specialties in Jewels by Queenie is uh, service. And that is something that people, consumers, really enjoy with jewelry. Because very quickly they want to know return policies, because it's an investment. They want to know if something breaks, how will it be fixed, especially if they are in a, uh, you know, a, a, like a second tier, third tier sort of city. And, uh, you know, the polishes, which is very important in jewelry. Service was the, is what we specialize in. We pick up the piece wherever the uh, customer is and deliver it back to them free of cost. That goes with our model. And that has really worked for us because people know. The other thing is to be present. That means if I'm doing a pop-up show in Chandigarh or I'm doing a pop-up show in Raipur, or uh, Bangalore, I will be doing it twice a year. So the people have faith that this person is coming back. And that, that again is very important. What I did do, however, during pandemic, was I started a, a digital online skincare brand with uh, Dr. Dinyar, if any of you know him. He's been in the business for 50 years. 
uh, and not because it was a hot space to be in, beauty, skincare, but because it was my passion. And I have learned a lot in the last two years. We uh, launched two, uh, last two months, because we launched two months ago, completely different model from the Jewels model. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's more stress on consumer satisfaction in a different way by mapping their journey, et cetera, et cetera. So both my, uh, both my businesses are completely passion-led and uh, because I do feel that when you work with something that's your passion, you never tire of it. Perfect, perfect. We like that. Like the way you are passionate about your business, we love it, like the, the kind of the experience you are giving. Eleven, your products are more touch and feel, like everybody wants to wear the Kanchi Purum and the Banasi saris or Seksha, right? Please tell us your story because in this pandemic time, pandemic time, how you want through this one? Yes, of course. Um, um, I'll be mindful of time here. I know that we do have a very illustrious panel. Uh, Quickly show of hands, how many of y'all are from the corporate sector versus entrepreneurs or you own your own business? Corporate? All right. Anyone who owns their own business? All right. Okay. That's a good spread. Um, the last two years, where do I start? In, this was the first time, at least in my father and grandfather's memory. Now, we had a family business established 1928, but we precede that, so about almost 100 years now. The first time that we faced a situation where all stores were shut and we had zero sales coming in. Not in my lifetime, not in my father's memory. In my grandfather's memory, when he was very young, when World War II happened, he remembers. And so that really shook us as an organization which is cash flow funded and not GMB focused. What do you do in a situation like that? Now, on the one hand, we had this, which was happening with our stores, and of course, we all went into huddle mode. The first things that you do is you take care of your people, your employees, your vendors, you know, it, all of that, because it all got upended. While this was happening on the one hand, and there was so much dynamism in terms of the rules coming out and, you know, what's allowed, what's not allowed, we had the e-commerce division, which I started five years ago, which had a different kind of problem. So it suddenly started getting way more interest, a lot of conversions, and we didn't have the staff to actually come in and even fulfill the orders. And we weren't as a tech platform even set up for that. So in a span of, I think, 15 days in March 2020, we went through this roller coaster of emotion um, as an organization and me personally to see, you know, the main heart of the business, right? The beating heart of the business, our offline stores, just suddenly became zero. And then here we have e-commerce, which was always seen as like a new growth business, an emerging business, just completely explode. And now we're facing issues like, how do you even get the staff to come in? Because you've got all of the, the laws and the rules and the circulars which say that they're allowed, but then they get stopped by all the cops on the way. Right? And then they're not allowed to congregate, but then how are you going to ship out all the orders that, you, that you've gotten conversions for? So that's a little bit of a snapshot of what happened in 15 days. Of course, since then, we've really found our bearings, and we've been able to have a much more seamless and integrated experience. Um, but we can get into that. I just wanted to leave you with um, an idea of what it's like behind the scenes. And I think whether you're in corporate or whether you're in business, if you're in a position of um, influence, authority, autonomy. I think all of us here would have probably resonated with some aspects of that story. Thank you, thank you. We would like to listen from you because you are only on the online, not have the offline. What is your plans and how do you manage your business or totally on online? Hi, can I be heard? Okay. Uh, so you're right, we're only online and uh, you know, we didn't have any stores in that sense to worry about. But I think when the initial lockdown happened, uh, we had issues around operations, delivery. Uh, we saw pickups happening in terms of sales and conversions, but we couldn't figure out how we were going to coordinate with all our brands. All of them were in uh, a pretty severe issue. I mean, and this continued even right until the last wave that we had in Jan, right? Because at the end of the day, we're also people-dependent businesses. So, you know, if 
one person or three or one to ten people even go down in a company, that means everything slows down. Especially we work with a lot of small brands, which are literally and they're often women-led uh, small brands, uh, which we're very proud about. But that means they're also like four to five uh, people. So I think that was something that we kind of figured out that we need to make sure our structures become far more rigid, I mean, are far more flexible and adaptable to these kind of things that are going to come our way. But what I think was interesting for us in the last two years, because we're so used to being online and we saw such a massive shift happen online in terms of not just us, but every other business, anything, right? Including Instagram, social media, all of it. We understood that we're going to have to bring the human back into the shopping element. And uh, you know that's what we're kind of working on, which we're trying to blend the physical aspect of what you get in touch and feel in a store how can we actually bring it in some way in the online space? And I great. think that's, that's what we're going to focus great, on. Great. Manishi, your industry was the worst hit in the pandemic time. It's a travel industry. And you belong to travel industries. It's in the uh, travel bags. Please tell us about your story. Uh, so I think uh, travel is something that we all have experienced in some way or the other. And uh, when the first pandemic, first time when it had hit, everything came to a standstill. We were all locked up in the houses. We were not allowed to go anywhere. Uh, that was the time, you know, we actually started preparing ourselves. Uh, the best thing probably during the COVID, what happened was that we became highly cost conscious. That helped us sustain that year. So we controlled, you know, a lot of things. Uh, where we could help the sustainability. So since I handle the retail vertical, retail vertical, the cost is uh, the static. Even if the business is happening or not, the cost is there. So we tried and controlled some of these costs. The second thing that happened with us is as soon as the lockdown, uh, the unlocking happened, people started traveling. One of the, not only travel, but in our business, weddings is one of the biggest thing which enables our business to grow. So as soon as the unlocking happened, the wedding started happening. So VIP as a brand, you know, it's one of the most loyal brands when it comes for weddings. So that was the other thing which helped us, you know, sustain us through the time when the times were tough, when the travel was very less. Another thing that we did was that we created store-wise catalogs, which we shared with the database of that particular store after seeking the permission from the consumers. In that, you know, the insight was that consumers were looking forward to something like this, where the communication happens about the actual product. And that helped us without getting the consumer to the store, we were able to sell. So just to share the data point, we converted almost 20% of the sales from those catalogs without even getting consumers to the store. So some of these initiatives during the pandemic really helped us. But when quarter three came after the first wave, which is the probably the first full-fledged quarter that we saw, I think the business just bounced back. We started hitting almost 19, 20 numbers. Uh, we were again back into the business. People started traveling. People started celebrating weddings and all of that. The other thing that uh, we took as an opportunity that we started incentivizing customers for shopping during that time. So it could be in the way of, you know, giving slightly higher discounts or, you know, uh, running free promos on a high bill value. I think all of that helped us really sustain our business at that time. But what we are seeing now is that travel is back. And the moment the fully unlocking is there, people just want to travel everywhere. So domestic travel is almost at 85% right now. Uh, international travel, we are hoping that, you know, it will be almost 50 to 60 percent as soon as 27th March, they are uh, opening all the flights. Student travel is almost there at about 80, 90 percent, which helps the business to grow. Weddings are being celebrated as grand as they were celebrated earlier. So that is helping us. So I think it's, it was just the moment. Now we have to coexist with this. We don't know that this is going to sustain for how long this kind of environment. So we have to create an ecosystem where we keep continuing the business, whether COVID is there or not there. So that's Thank how you. it has been. Lokesh, you have a very diverse 
uh, experience you worked with the retailers. Now you are into the retail industry. Tell me your story. Okay, uh, we are a budding brand in activewear category and I think activewear is kind of category in pandemic which everybody realized that it's an important category in the wardrobe. So everybody started wearing activewear. It gave us a time to actually make our online more robust, our backend more robust so that we can deliver to the people during the pandemic time as well and post pandemic time as well. Because now the time is there when people, everybody is going to workouts for gyms, for everybody and wherein people want to wear a good activewear product. That's where we came into the picture and we re reinvented ourselves at the back end and at the front end, both sides. And made sure that the customer is, gets what he wants at the lowest period of time. That's where the, I think the whole scenario changed after pandemic. And during pandemic also we have delivered I think uh, more than what we were delivering initially. Because that's the time when people really wanted to uh, use active wear category. You were having big 25 stores. All stores are approximately 25,000 square feet. Right? If, if the stores are big, the pain is also big. Tell us your story. Everybody yeah. wants to listen from you. So it's been an interesting two years. So, you know, I want to start by giving a context to what we were. So we were a high double digit negative pat company pre pandemic came the first wave and everybody asked me one question, will you survive? So, you know, the question of now I'll answer the question of how we survived and what we've accomplished. So I think we were an extremely traditional, conservative, offline company, which never believed in online. So I think came the first wave and IV changed our vision. We made our entire company, company technology based. And when I say technology means from every end, uh, may it be integrating with marketplaces, building our own website, to completely aligning the customer experience, to aligning the offline and the online strategy in the start. What we are today, in these two years, we have added one lakh square feet retail space. Great. We have moved from a negative pat company pre-pandemic to next year being a double digit positive pat company. Wow. We have acquired three big brands in the last two years. And today when I look back, you know the start was right. I think we looked, we, we huddled in the first wave, we said we need to become nimble, we need to put technology first, which we had not done. And that is what has created the difference for us. So the journey has been incredible, you know, I just wanted to just put it in a case study. Thanks. Someone you tell us about, say, you belong to the laundry line, say what the kind of the experience you have say pre-pandemic and post-pandemic also? So, uh, during, uh, you know, when the pandemic started, uh, it, it was a nightmare for all of us and for the first two days probably we all froze. Uh, good thing is that our production, our sales team and our vendors came together and they quickly diversified into the need of the hour of PP kits and masks. The team was on, uh, the sales team was on calls with government, government agencies, NGOs and all and we we quickly uh, started rolling and uh, producing PP kits and we were all back to track uh, in terms of the, uh, the required funds and you know, the survival of the company. Uh, we had just launched loungewear before uh, the pandemic hit and, uh, and we were surprised that the post pandemic, you know, the moment uh, the lockdown opened up, uh, we had a crazy, uh, you know, multiples of uh, uh, lounge and active wear orders and our team was running here and there to get those uh, production done. So that category uh, for us really picked up, lounge and the active wear categories along with uh, the, our regular categories. So uh, once we opened up, uh, you know, uh, once the lockdowns uh, norms were relaxed, uh, for us, uh, quarter on quarter online growth was almost doubled and uh, uh, as the retail stores opened up, uh, there was huge growth uh, uh, noticed in the retail uh, sector as well. Uh, 
uh, generally the customers were coming, the footprints, uh, the customers who were coming to store were the, the customers who really wanted to buy and they wanted to stock up because they did not know what was, uh, what was the in store for the next uh, few months. So uh, from there on, you know, things, things started scaling and uh, thankfully things have been good for us. Thank you. Uh, like you have your stores into tier two and tier two, three cities. How did this affect it in you last two years and how you came into the say like experience and came back into the picture say like and growth. Tell us about your growth story also into that one. Sure, thank you. So uh, we, we started in the year 2016 and we were growing at a very rapid pace, you know, similar to uh, what Apoor described. So the first three years we went from zero to 60 stores. So very, very rapid growth. And suddenly, you know, uh, so it was a surprise. The first wave of the pandemic was definitely a surprise. And uh, like everyone, we went into a lot of tactical solutions of managing our costs, uh, keeping, taking care of our employees, liquidating our inventories, multiple sort of efforts went in there. Uh, obviously, we were better prepared and, uh, you know, I, I think it was more of an opportunity. And now that we group back again at our company, we think it was more of an opportunity because we were growing at such a rapid pace, we never got a breather. We never got to, we were always fixing things as we're growing because our processes, our infrastructure, our digitization, everything was just being fixed as we were moving at a very rapid pace. So it gave us a bit of a breather. Uh, we learned about risk managing. How, how do you buy and risk manage? How do you plan for a surge? Suddenly the requirements hit you and you're not prepared for it. So we could put a lot of things in place, our processes. We built, we, we invested a lot in our infrastructure during this period, uh, which is bearing fruit now. Uh, and, and particularly on digitization, so we, have significantly digitized ourselves over the past two years, uh, which obviously throws us the possibility of uh, entering omnichannel uh, retailing, uh, API integrations with the CRM systems, with uh, putting our inventory on auto replenishment. So lots and lots of possibilities and options have opened up just because we went through this journey. So uh, while obviously, you know, I, I wish this never occurs, but in a way it, it threw us uh, an opportunity to fix many a things that we wouldn't have otherwise gotten to. Yeah. So now, one thing is clear, everybody wants, every retail company wants to work online as well as the offline, the people who were the say, purely offline brands, they want their own D2C, they want to sell on marketplace, the people who were only on the online, they want to sell offline also, they want to open their stores also. Right, and uh, moreover, now if if you are going into the two channels, how you are going to be profitable? That's the main concern because the logistics are so involved into it. So we'll start from you. Please let me know. Hi. Hello. Yeah. So I think uh, you know it, this applies to us, but I think it also applies to a lot of other businesses, right? Uh, and is understanding what you're expecting from both these channels, whether it's offline or online. And we're very clear for us, offline is going to be an engagement channel. We're not expecting conversions from there, which actually then determines what our strategy is. How do we go about thinking about it? Maybe it's just awareness. Maybe it's an opportunity for loyal customers. Maybe it's you know, some place where we just go and tie up with different partners and you know, do something that's interesting. But for us as a brand that is also tiny, we're a young brand, <clears throat> we can't afford to go and expand in a crazy manner and do offline. But online is also where our bread and butter is. At the end of the day, we're a personal styling service like Netflix, right? So we rely on user data and we need more and more information that comes in. So it's only once you know, she's interacting with us online, giving us information, that's when we can do something useful. So we're very clear about that, that we are going to be online primarily. Offline is going to be something that we use as an engagement or as a you know, way to kind of like interact with our loyal customers. One thing that we've started doing is, which I mentioned, is we're, we're trying to blend uh, you know, the human element into the online aspect. And we've started playing around with live commerce and live shopping, where we have an expert, uh, we have a style expert or a product expert come in 
and talk to our users on specific topics or on specific uh, occasions and then give her advice on what works and what doesn't work. And that's how we're going to continue. Uh, Vini, I would like to ask from you first, because time is going to be 1.30 and your flight. You know, so tell us, say, like, how do you see online and offline in your organization? Well, for, uh, for jewelry, we do pop-up shows everywhere. Online is really to just acquaint yourselves with what we have to offer designs, etc. Fits, designs, colors, you know, the, the stuff that we specialize in. Skincare is what I want to just touch upon because um, I do believe that uh, the testers, you know, pop up shows, but you know, the testers available for the feel of a product is very, very important. And for me, being a you know skincare junkie all my life, I do feel that uh, you know the touch and feel of a product is in this business is very important. However, I also see that uh, during pandemic, even though people talk about you know businesses coming back and business has come back, there's one thing that will never come back is the way a consumer thinks. The consumer mindset is completely changed. The world has changed. So we are not catering to a world pre-pandemic, we're catering to a new world. So I feel that choice is huge, mindsets are different, uh, mapping a consumer journey has become ultra important, making skin, uh, you know, like uh, basically routines, uh, customized uh, routines for people using AI, etc is become also mandatory. Uh, people have less time, they have less patience, even when you're talking about social media, uh, you know, the whole concept of social media has changed. It's all like, like that. It goes literally really quick. Nobody has the patience to see those long-ended uh, films anymore. We also see, we also understand, uh, at least the people who are running businesses, that the only way to determine success is if the consumer thinks you're successful. Otherwise, it's, it's so like I say, we, uh, our whole uh, tech, the technology has become all important. The world has just changed and I feel that, uh, you know, your mapping, your profits are based on, on how efficient your business is your lead time, your, uh, your delivery time, your, your explaining to a customer exactly how to use, where to use, what to use. These things have become very important because the world is different. It's 1.30 if you want to leave. I, I, we would, like you, we, we would like you to be here, but yeah. as you told your flight like is... Travel is now back. Thank you. It's lovely to be on the panel. Thank you very thank, much. Please thank, excuse thank me thank and I apologize. Thank you very much, Vinnie. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Uh, we are running out of time. So we want to be very, very quick and very, very brief, right? Lavanya, we would like to uh, listen from you. Say like you are into now into the online and offline, how you made your p and strong in this one. So um, the first thing that I'll say, which I guess is sounds obvious, but the PNL only matters if you know the people who own the company thinks that it matters, um, and the reason that I say that is uh, it really depends on what your investors. If you've got investors in the company, it depends on what they are concerned about and what they're chasing. So if they're chasing scale, then you're an ac you're on an acquisition spree, and then it really isn't about the bottom line, but it really is about growth, about scale, uh, your customer base growing, repeats, all of those things. Now for us given that we were a cash flow funded business, it's always been about the bottom line. And uh, very quickly, the cost structures of our online and our offline stores are fundamentally different. And it's just first principles. You take any, um, any unit, any business unit, and then you pair that down and you say, okay, look, this is here's sales, here's you know, here net sales. In our case, it's the same because we don't have discounts. Um, and then you strip away COGS, you strip away all of the other major uh, cost uh, items. 
What are those major cost items? If it's going to be offline, rent is probably going to be one of the big things. But what happens when you, get, when you invest in rent and when you invest in a good location is that a lot of your marketing is already done for you because you've, all, you've identified a location which is in a high street location. You're going to pick up on um, you know, residual traffic or you're going to end up being a destination store, but you put yourself on the map. E-commerce doesn't have rent. E-commerce also doesn't have salespeople. But what it does have is digital marketing. Your digital storefront is where these costs are going to shift from your offline PNL to your online PNL. Over and above that, your tech platform. Now, of course, today they've democratized that, and you've got Shopify, which has like a plug-and-play model. Um, you've got, you know, you've got Magenta, uh, you've got um, Mintra and Amazon and all of the marketplaces. But the way that they work is they, of course, take a cut. Right? Everyone's got to make a buck. So. The costs exist. How you, how you work out your PNL really just comes down to the strategic calls that you take. And it really comes down also to how much your profit really matters. If you're on a growth spree, it probably doesn't matter as much. But if you're a cash flow funded business, which we are in a space in e-commerce where you know, we're up against the big guns who are pretty much funded by you know, all of China and Japan, that's a whole other ballgame. Manish, tell me about your p and say like how it is, uh, like now you are into the positive p and or it's, it's or struggling with the online p and or something like that one, is it different or you consolidated with that one or not? Uh, so in our category, uh, one thing is very clear that online vertical that we have, it's a value game. We don't want to compete with the premium uh, segment in the online segment. So if I have to give you the idea that how it behaves is so against an online channel, our retail vertical is three times in terms of average selling price. So we, when it comes to offline retail, we are the highest gross margin channel. And that gives us the confidence that, you know, this channel will still sustain irrespective of whether any pandemic is there or not there. Because when the consumer is buying, which is mid premium or premium, he would like to have a touch and feel in most of the cases. And that's how, you know, we think that offline retail will continue, but parallelly we'll have to create an ecosystem where we are able to communicate to the consumer when he is not able to visit the store. So we are creating a omni-channel platform in consultation with some of the experts that how do we improve our offline retail by integrating and talking to the consumers online. So one is digital marketing, what uh, everybody has spoken about. Another is uh, that uh, we are creating virtual stores where consumers will be able to see the product, understand, go through the features, understand the price, or maybe come to the store which is nearest available and you know pick up that product readily available. And as far as PNL is concerned, I think uh, now we are in double digits again. Last one year, uh, 2020-21 was bad, but 21-22, we will touch double digits, which is back to 1920 numbers. I think that is going to help us. Thank you. Uh, <coughs> little bit, see, like, I'm changing here because we are running out of time. See, uh, in any... If we talk about retail industry, there are the two parts. One is the front end and second is the back end, right? So e-commerce, FOSS, your loyalty, your endless aisle, your smart mirrors or something, et cetera, which enhances the consumer experience. And at the back end, when you have your supply chain management, logistics, your warehouse, your finances, your procurement, vendor management, auto replenishment, et cetera, if your back end is not strong or not well placed at your back end, then your consumer experience of a toss. Lokesh, I would like to know your experience, say like how you made your back end strong and you can tell us your past experiences also. So I'll tell you, uh, the back end is the backbone of every detail organization. That is one thing which is read, said and written on the stones that that's, that's where the whole business lies. Uh, with the past experience, I would say to you that uh, we had 1800 SAS windows where we had to supply a FMCG kind of a product 
and it could only be possible by making a backend strong with the help of technology. That's the, where the, I think the whole pin lies, wherein you have to make your backend as robust as possible, wherein you can supply to your each and every channel, the right product available at the right time, which is the most important part. And if that has been able to manage with the strongest backend that you can do, I think you have made the win. Say like we would like to know like like what kind of the technologies you have implemented to make your backend strong and in the context of your giving a best consumer experience so you know we keep talking about omnichannel we keep talking about uh, you know acquiring more and more customers through online channel but i think it starts by first building on certain blocks you know, you need to have a seamless inventory. That's huge. You need to have a very seamless logistic system. Obviously, technology plays a huge role. And, uh, you know, eventually you are serving the same customer. You know, a lot of people say that the online and the offline customer is a different customer. I don't believe that. It's a single customer. Yeah. In his journey of lifetime purchase, he may prefer online first or offline first. So that's why... Backend is extremely important because if you're not giving him the same experience in both the channels, he will get away. He will go to someone else because today choices are many. So, small example. He'll right? get confused. Yeah. Small example. You know, we all focus on forward process. We say, you know, the latest thing is 10 minutes delivery, right? Nobody talks about 10 minutes return. So, I think one area where we focused and where we have succeeded in retaining our customer and actually using the online channel to build an offline customer is on the refund process. So there, you know, we are giving a seamless experience, obviously through technology, where there is a no question asked refund process, may it be in online or the offline channel. And if a customer comes who is purchased from online to offline, he gets a seamless experience. So, you know, this is extremely important. The whole world on one side, is talking about 10 minutes deliveries, tomorrow it will talk about 1 minute delivery. Who talks about 10 minutes return? Who talks about 10 minutes refund? Nobody. So I think, but for us as offliners, for us to create customer experiences, because we have created stores which create engagement and experience, if we don't build in technology for tomorrow, which will give the same experience and uh, like our own experience, you know, we will fail. We will actually create more customer dissatisfaction than experience. Very well said. Very well said, sir. Very well said. So, <clears throat> you tell us about your story, sir. So, so like uh, what kind of the technologies you have implemented for your backend. And so moreover, as well as for consumer experience, as well as the profitability also. See, for us, we have been always an online, uh, we, uh, online first uh, brand. So, uh, we have an uh, in-house uh, build uh, uh, software called, we call the Monk, which predicts the, uh, which predicts what's going to sell, which uh, generates the purchase orders uh, for the sales and the production team. And uh, we, uh, the moment a style goes live, uh, we have uh, engines in our uh, backend software which immediately starts predicting uh, how much is the style uh, selling, which part of the country is it selling, what are the complaints in those style, what is customer uh, returning about it, and uh, every, every bit of detail that we can get. As we you know, say, you know, the customer is the king, so we would want to serve the king to the best, and it is really, really tough to get timeshare of the king. So, uh, we would really want to serve them the best, best possible way in terms of, you know, providing a better back-end and, of, of course, a front-end uh, service to them. Yeah. Rohiji, uh, you have thousands of SKU, hundreds of vendor. How do you manage that one? So, like, um, like you mentioned earlier, uh, 
the complexity that we handle, because we, we uh, in our stores offer apparels, we offer home merchandise, we offer footwear, we offer FMCG goods. So the number of SKUs is very high. We upwards of 60,000 SKUs. We deal with more than 500 vendors. We have 83 stores. So the level of complexity is very high. And without a robust infrastructure and a real-time infrastructure, you know, we, we can't operate. Uh, and then it only leads to inefficiencies in the system, whether it's inventory in inefficiency, whether it's sales in uh, stockouts, sales inefficiencies, customer experience, all of that. Uh, so like I mentioned earlier as well, uh, building a robust infrastructure, relying on strong technology partners to deliver, building our processes which fully leverage the technology that we've built on uh, is absolutely essential for us. What we do beyond that is it throws a bunch of possibilities, which if you've not built a strong infrastructure, the possibilities weren't ever occurring. So uh, a strong analytics uh, sort of backend for decision making, saying which customer is buying what, who's not buying what, where is your stock line without sell through. Uh, none of that is possible if you do not have depth of information, width of information, granular information, real time information. Your integration with other uh, softwares or other applications, whether it's a CRM application, whether it's a auto replenishment application, whether it's a uh, marketing automation application, it just becomes impossible if you are running on a old client server technology kind of an architecture because you're never going to be able to do that. Uh, so all of that is absolutely essential. From a customer perspective, you know, we obviously have a different experience because we are in tier two, tier three cities. So uh, as compared to Metro, uh, the customers aren't as technology savvy. Obviously COVID has changed quite a bit of that. And, and some of it is our realization as well. But what's interesting for our customers is that clothing and apparels isn't necessarily a want. It isn't necessarily that I want another pair of shirt or another pair of uh, trousers because it's the new year and a new celebration or something. It's, it's a bunch of needs as well. Kids are still growing. So they are outgrowing their clothes and they need that to be replaced. So even in the middle of pandemic, we would get calls. Our stores would get calls saying, can you please find a back door for me to shop? People would buy clothes video calling and picking clothes on a video call on a small little phone with our store staff. So, there is clearly a demand and that's why Omnichannel has become a no-brainer for us saying we have inventory, all we need is a channel, another channel to address the same customer base. Uh, during this period, we experimented putting our products on a marketplace and we realized that since we are a value conscious brand, because of that value, people where they don't even recognize the states, the cities that we are not even present are buying on a marketplace from us which means my customer base is much wider than I currently think it is. So there are lots and lots of these possibilities which an omni-channel platform, a strong backend infrastructure throws, uh, which without this we wouldn't have been doing. What a lovely session, sir. What a lovely session you have given us a, a very good knowledge and rich us for that one. Thank you very much. I think we were running out of time, sir. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Thank you very much, the lovely ladies. Thank you.